how they launch their product, what type of ad platform they rely most on, apart from Amazon. Well, I think you know, if we if we are looking at brands over the five million dollar range, I think that's a good number. I've heard that number kind of tossed around a lot this year, mainly in the. So, how do you look at right now the species? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I started free up in 2016, and back then there weren't as many agencies and VA services that you necessarily have now. But I mean, when we exited. Uh, following hello everyone welcome to the rich sellers podcast today i bring in chris and nathan with me to speak on the topic on how to build a successful amazon business 2023 now this is a uh, questions that a lot of you guys were asking and i thought to bring on the experts to talk about this so without further ado let me just uh, go with the introduction about our guest so chris would you like to start with a small introduction about yourself sure chris brewer i'm the owner of uh, omg commerce we are a amazon full service agency i've been around since 2010 uh, we're also known for our expertise with Google Ads, YouTube, Google Shopping, and Performance Max, as well as email with, from a Klaviyo perspective. So we're a strategic marketing performance marketing agency for brands that would like to uh, accelerate their growth. That's great. That's great. Nathan, uh, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, so I was a, a big Amazon seller from 2008 to 2016. I built and sold the, the free up marketplace, which is a marketplace for Amazon virtual assistants and freelancers. Uh, and now I run Outsource School, which teaches sellers how to hire uh, virtual assistants. And I also own Ecom Balance, which is a monthly bookkeeping service for e-commerce sellers. Yeah. I think that was great. So when you talk about Amazon selling and Amazon, I think this two, two topics comes in the first place. First is obviously bookkeeping because we need to stay on top of our taxes. Then the next topic comes is ads. So I think you two are the best guests that we can have for today's podcast. Starting with Chris, I think uh, this question, you can answer it really properly on this. Like when you talk about ads in Amazon now, because a lot has been changed since the start of Amazon. Now there are a lot of type of ads that sellers are running, right? But when you look at a specific brand perspective, let's assume they are doing more than five, 10 million a year in sales. What they generally look at, do they are more into DSP? They allocate specific budget to DSP or how they launch their product? What type of ad platform they rely most on apart from Amazon? Well, I think you know, if we if we are looking at brands over the five million dollar range, and I think that's a, a good number. I've heard that number kind of tossed around a lot this year, mainly in the sense of the kind of decline that we've seen uh, from a D to C brand demand, kind of uh, in a post iOS world and a post COVID world, where um, some of the consumer habits have slowed down a bit. I do think that. Brands that are sub five million dollars, uh, in you know, with I'm sure there's exceptions here, but it's a lot harder to yeah. scale a brand uh, right now if you haven't reached kind of a volume level that's going to allow you to kind of sustain through some of these more challenging times with ad costs that are increasing and things like that, and that's really. What's kind of nice actually about Amazon, because we live in both worlds in terms of Shopify stores, Magento, WooCommerce, those stores off Amazon. And we see the pressures on brands right now with increasing ad costs, increasing CPAs. And so we see a lot more, uh, I'll just say off Amazon brands looking to Amazon, mm -hmm. especially if they've got branded search that's happening on the platform that they can take hold of that. And then in, in terms of ads, what we're seeing again, you know, sometimes old things become new again, things pop up again. Like I was at a conference just this last week in Puerto Rico 
or a Facebook expert, Molly Pittman was talking about how they're seeing lookalike audiences start to work a bit more uh, than they used to. And we're hearing brands revisit now about DSP. You mentioned DSP and DSP was one of those shiny objects that a lot of brands kind of rushed into and a lot of agencies had access to it as well. They didn't all do such a great job in terms of communicating what DSP was intended to do. So you had a lot of brands just do three, four month tests on DSP and then vacate it. But what we're seeing now is those brands in that $5 million, $8 million, $10 million range, they've resisted going into DSP. Amazon is coming back saying, no, you need to have it as a channel. And then we're getting them kind of as an independent third party with the brand saying, hey, what do we do? And so I do think DSP is a channel for sure that you should look at but you should definitely make sure you've got a provider that's going to look out for your own best interests and also tell you in many cases what you need to hear, which is DSP is not something you can just dip your toe into for three or four months at low audience levels and low spins and just, and then stop it and see if your sales change because the percentages usually the, the fluctuation, excuse me, the fluctuations you have in your ad account, on a day-to-day -day basis or month-over-month -month basis, you're not going to be able to stop something, sponsor display or DSP or something else and see it make a, a big overall impact. But just in general, I think that's something that brands should definitely revisit at least if they've, if they've had a bad experience maybe before with DSP. Yeah, I think, I think that was spot on, especially the spent point of view that you have talked about. We have seen brands... Because when they started with DSP, it was a shiny object syndrome, as you told. But they didn't have a proper goal set in their mind that for which purpose we want to use it. Because DSP, what we have seen, it is expensive, right? It is expensive, plus the ROAS that you get is not so much great. So again, if we just calculate on a TACO's point of view, you wouldn't see really good satisfying result out of it. But if you're looking at it as a separate channel that, okay, we can bring on some extra traffic from it and put it in the top of the funnel then i think it is quite good and obviously the spend has to be justified you have to do a certain amount of volume in order to get to that to spend a certain amount in dsp otherwise there's a really good channels like google ads which will go in deep uh, later on in this session as well so yeah i think that was great now now yeah, moving just, on to nathan yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah just real quick and then we can kick it over to Nathan. The thing I'd want sellers to keep in mind on this is that the thing you want to be hearing from an agency or provider on this is really about a probably a six month plan where at month three, you're evaluating where your tacos is from an overall perspective and make sure you've got a good goal overall so that because what we have seen is in our case studies mm -hmm. have proven this out that brands that stick with DSP into the five and six month range, that's when we have the data and enough of a look back window to see actually higher efficiency PPC and reduction in tacos. We, we had a brand that reduced their tacos by seven points even over a six month span. But it's one of those that our, if they had looked at their numbers after month two, they would have canceled. So uh, I just think it's good perspective and um, I also think, you know, in this day and age with the increasing costs, the kind of things that Nathan's involved in with outsourcing and getting virtual help can be a real help to your, your bottom line. Yeah, totally. I think uh, Nathan being a former Amazon seller as well, you know exactly what are the pain points of Amazon sellers, right? So uh, let's talk about uh, the virtual assistant part a little bit. So how are sellers right now looking at it because it was kind of a hot topic when we are trying to sell like i was selling in 2017 and i sold and exited in 2019 so how do you look at right now the spaces yeah it's interesting i mean i started free up in 2016 and back then there weren't as many uh agencies and, and va services that you necessarily have now but i mean when we exited a, a virtual our virtual assistant team was a big part of it i mean we our team went with the sale um they the sops that we had that the virtual assistants were, were following uh were a big piece of it as well and i talked to a lot of sellers now who 
uh, they have the, these really great teams that, that know their Amazon business really well. And, and that helps their uh, valuation, especially if they're selling it to an aggregator or someone that's kind of absorbing their team. So I think that's a big part of it. I think the expertise side when it comes to those VAs and freelancers has increased. I know when I started, a lot of the times it was, hey, VA, follow this process, uh, do things my way. But now you have all these different service providers that have their own systems, their own processes that they've seen success with that if you don't know how to do something when it comes to Amazon, and we know that Amazon uh, keeps get adding more and more work to the seller's plate, you don't have to master every little thing. And you can delegate and hire the right people that already know PPC. They already know how to create really good listings. They already know how to make good graphics and you can kind of pull them in. And when it comes to freelancers, you can really build up a good Rolodex of different reliable video editors, graphic designers, listers that you could pull into different businesses um, and, and allow you to kind of skip a, a lot of the early process of starting a brand, finding people, interviewing people, all that mm -hmm. stuff, because you already have this Rolodex of, of talented Amazon people that you can just hit the ground running with. And I think that's what a lot of really big, really good sellers are, are doing as they launch brand after brand. Yeah, Nathan, I think that is a really important point. And I think Chris would also agree with me on this because when we started our agency, uh, at first we started hiring interns on it, right? Because what we used to think is if we got a problem, uh, let's throw some people into the problem and people will solve the problem. But it turned around completely sideways. So what happened is uh, now we only uh, hire talented experts who are already trained in that field. And what you're talking about, you provide all those who are already talented. I think talent is really important when you look for hiring, right? So I think uh, that is something really cool that you are doing and sellers could really find the benefit out of it. So uh, Chris, moving on to this part, right? You have been running an agency since long, like it's been really a long year and uh, you have gone through the pain points of hiring, then uh, training them, then going through all the process, creating your own SOP. And now I think uh, you're handling uh, really big brands right now in your agency as well. So uh, moving on to this hiring part, right? Because what Nathan also talked about, the talent is really important. So when you talk about the Amazon PPC space or Amazon ad space in general, how hard it is to find a talented expert that can stay in your team It's easier than it was 12 months ago. Um, you had the aggregator effect um, mm -hmm. over the last three years. And a lot of those aggregators have de-aggregated. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, you had the public uh, information from Thrasio of laying off, I think it was over 300 people. And a lot of those super smart people, very talented people, so, you know, there's a mixture of things that happen anytime you, you have a uh, kind of powering down again, again or, or you see volume reducing. And so that is you get more talent that's out on the, the street, so to speak. And that's where I think, at least from an agency perspective, I'll try to speak both agency and brand because I kind of live in, in both worlds, is from an agency yeah. side, um, we started with fully outsourced 13 years ago. We actually had a group out of the Philippines that we did everything mm -hmm. through highly profitable, but also highly volatile in the sense that it takes one monsoon and a power outage to disrupt your business for three or four days. Um, and if you have the leaders of the company, which in our case was a U.S. owner, who was operating out of the U.S., a Filipino team, uh, just best practices and things started eroding to the point where we decided, hey, we want to hire in-house. And so mm -hmm. we worked from a hiring perspective of finding and following a very diligent process to find uh, the right hires that were a culture fit and uh, not whether we were out, because we continue today, I've got over 70 team members and out of those 70 team members, I've got probably 53 or so that are employees, W-2. Um, I've got a couple of Canadians. I've got a 13-member Filipino team that I picked up on an acquisition. 
And then we, we also use Upwork and services like Nathan's to find those VAs and experts in areas. And I think that's the thing that both brands and agencies need to keep in mind is that if you're closed minded on agencies or VAs or in-house teams, you're, you're, you're never going to get anywhere. And of course, if you're against all three, you just can't start a business. Right. But what I'm getting at is that I'm in a lot of forums and, and, and brand groups. And so uh, there's always a brand or two or five that's had a bad agency experience. Now, when in life have you not had a bad service company experience? Bad plumber, bad electrician, bad architect, bad haircut. I mean, they're all out there, but you don't quit using a plumber because you had one bad experience or two. But what you learn is you've got to be a lot more diligent on the front end of interviewing, vetting, checking out. And that's what I think a lot of brands, Amazon brands make the mistake of is uh -huh. they hear someone speak, or they hear someone interviewed on a podcast, they jump right in with both feet. They never ask for references. They don't ask who is the team they're going to be working with. They don't ask yeah. how you are training your team. And then you find out three or four months later that you've made the wrong decision. And then it becomes, I'm never going to hire an agency again. And, or I'm never going to use a VA again. And um, so that's just where from a perspective point of view, I think it's important in your business to lay out where in my business can I make the most use of outsourced hires? And where in my business do I need to have someone that's integral, dedicated salary benefits, uh, what have you, that's in it with me for the long haul? Yeah, Chris, I'm, I'm redoing my basement right now, and it's very similar to the stuff we teach at Outsource School, finding uh, finding people, interviewing them, re recommendations, like you said, referrals, um, but then also just setting expectations and making sure everyone's on the same page with everything at the same time. And it's a good, a good life skill to have whenever you hire anyone for anything. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, it just doesn't, it, I wish, I wish brands would do more of that. It, and it's just, they'll spend hours interviewing logistics companies and going back and forth and comparing. They won't spend as much time with their personnel and, and people. And, um, and I, I just think that's something that uh, could make a real, real difference in your, in your growth. Yeah, completely yeah, agree. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, moving on, Nathan, uh, we also discuss about book bookkeeping, right? So uh, we had one client that is doing like 25 million in coffee niche and they are really struggling with bookkeeping. So I think you got some solution to it, right? So why don't you uh, just tell us yeah. about it? How sellers yeah. can... I mean, to start off, no seller should be doing their own bookkeeping. First of all, it's a terrible mm -hmm. use of your time. Your time should be spent on marketing, expanding, launching products, um, higher level decisions. And second of all, most of the time that that sellers do their own bookkeeping, they're not bookkeepers and they just have to pay someone to, to do it correctly down the line. And cleanup work always costs more than just doing it right from uh, day one. And kind of off of that, I mean, there's so many reasons to, to have clean books. I mean, when we sold free up, we had four years of immaculate books going back to the first day. And, and one of the, the best hires we ever made was a bookkeeper from day one before we were even profitable. I mean, most businesses are going to go out of business because of their bookkeeper expense, but they are going to go mm -hmm. out of business because they don't have clean financials that they're making decisions on. But I mean, selling a company, getting funding, getting investments, making tax season uh, less stressful, all reasons to have a bookkeeper. But the real reason, because most sellers aren't going to sell, they aren't going to get investment or funding. The real reason is for good monthly decisions. You should have a, a monthly process where the month ends, you get books by the end, by the 15th of the month or earlier. You have a, a monthly finance meeting on your calendar every single month where you go through income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. You compare it to the previous month. You compare it to the same month last year. And that's the meeting you make decisions on. You don't make it by the money you're getting deposited in your bank account or the Amazon sales that you see in your account or by gut on a random Tuesday morning. You make it by the, what the numbers are actually telling you. And 
you make sure that your reports are segmented in a way where if you're selling five products and you're losing money on one of them, you can actually see that and, and make decisions accordingly. And, and it's not all lumped together. Yeah, Nathan, that, I got to jump in because that's really outstanding. And like that, that speaks to a pain point that we have on the agency side. Um, I know this won't shock you, Nathan, but I, I'm constantly shocked by the seven figure brands that contact us. And I don't often see it in, in bigger brands than that, but but the seven figure brands that contact us and um, we're talking about goals. And I, obviously when I'm interviewing a, a potential client, I'm wanting to find out, do they know their numbers? Just like you're on Shark Tank. You know, if you don't know your numbers on Shark Tank, you're out of the tank usually. And so right. for me, what, because I'm not trying to get every single brand that comes in the door, I'm asking them, tell me a little bit about what's your overall portfolio goal. Do you look at it from an ACOS or a TACOS? perspective? What other angles are you looking at? Tell me about your profitability. And when brand owners say, well, you know, I, I, I'm just I'm just going to have to check that. I'm going to have to look. I don't know when they don't have a, a quick grasp, like being able to pull up a financial and tell me what cost of goods sold and how on earth are you going to hire an agency? Because you're you're going to just say, well, I just want to have 10 percent tacos. OK, well, where did you get that number? Well, I from a forum. I, I read on a forum, yeah. you need to have 10% tacos. Oh, well, that for, but for your niche, that's like you should, you could handle 25% for your niche. So why would you hold back the growth? Those are all the things that like, again, if you've got solid books with a provider that also is going to be able to say, and I'm just curious, Nathan, if this is something you would do, like, I would love to be a brand owner and be able to tell my bookkeeper, Hey, every month, or week, two weeks, I want an executive summary that says, this is my trending tacos, this is my trending cost of goods sold, what have you. So you've got ready recall of those numbers and even be able to push ad sales on products that have higher margins and pull back uh -huh. on those that don't. Yeah, I mean, we, we do everything monthly. We don't have a weekly service, but yeah, exactly. Like the trends are so key. It's funny when I, I've never had a, a real job, but at my internship back in the day uh, at Firestone, every day they would post on the wall, like sales from yesterday, sales from the same day last year, and you would compare both. And the same thing rings true. Like you, when, when we get our monthly hmm. books for our companies, we're, we're comparing payroll this month, the last month, this month, the last year, we're going through our, the different services we offer and sales and, and profit margins and all those same things uh, still apply. And it, it blows my mind how few sellers are, are actually doing that uh, on a monthly basis. Yeah. And Nathan, you, you're going to have to contact me on LinkedIn after the podcast because I, I just launched a brand actually with uh, a friend and a manufacturer. We each have a third and I'm in charge of the bookkeeping and I'm the worst person for that. And I knew I was going to want to hire a, sort, a resource from day one. Uh, even though, you know, we're only doing about a thousand dollars in sales right now a day. Uh, but you know, that's not bad for first three or four weeks in. So, um, you and I'll have to talk after. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah, guys, I think that was an awesome discussion. So, uh, we are already 30 minutes up. So, uh, wow. Chris, when where can I people find you? Yeah. Uh, Easiest place for people to find me is on my website, which is omgcommerce.com. Okay. I encourage folks out there to check out our, our guides and our resources. My business partner, Brett Curry, has a podcast you may have heard of called E-Commerce Evolution. Uh, we're, that's been going on since 2017, so a great kind of top 10 e-com podcast. But you can just go to our site, click on Strategy Session. That'll come right across my desk, and I respond to every email that comes across as long as you're not trying to pitch me something without a good book. <laughs> yeah. Nathan, where can people find you? Uh, yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn, Nathan Hirsch. Uh, you can check out outsourceschool.com or ecombalance.com if you're interested in either one. Uh, if you mentioned this podcast, you get two months free of bookkeeping. And uh, yeah, lo love connecting with other people in the space. Uh, great meeting you, Chris. I sent you a LinkedIn message. And, and Sammy, thanks for having us on. Thank you, guys. I think it was an awesome discussion to have you both in the same screen and discuss about the topics. I think we should keep on doing uh, this kind of podcast on a regular basis. Uh, thank you, guys, so much for joining today. I'll see you again. Bye. Take care, guys.